We're Team Human, coming to you alive from the Basement Laboratory for Digital Humanism at CUNY Queens College and online at teamhuman.fm. My name is Artie Sirius, a.k.a. Ken Goffman, and I'm on Team Human. I'm L.A. Kaufman, and I'm on Team Human. I'm David Sachs, and I'm on Team Human. I'm Pia Mancini from Open Collective, and I'm on Team Human. I'm William Hoagland, and I'm on Team Human. You're on Team Human. Our guest today, award-winning playwright J.T. Rogers, whose new work, Oslo, recounts the famous secret back-channel discussions between Israel and the Palestinians in the 1990s that led to the Oslo Accords. Right now, in a time of of great uh, environmental, political, social stress, most people think of theater as a place to go escape from the issues, the headlines and all. And you walk into Lincoln Center and see Oslo, and you're confronted with uh, something in, in some way, you know, d- deeper and richer, more, more political than the front page of New York Times Week in Review at this point. This is uh, it, it's not that it's work, but this is the real world. Do you feel this is a, a difficult time or an important time to do plays that are about real issues? Both. I mean, it's it's a dark and difficult time in general. It's a dark and difficult time for the theater because if you have any sort of self-awareness, I think you're constantly waking up every morning and thinking, oh my God, why am I doing this? What is the point? Who cares? And that you also know you must do this because, you know, the, the sort of ruthless, selfish truth of it is that when times are dark, that's when the theater actually becomes necessary. And for me point of a play like Oslo or anything I'm writing is I have a dual task, which is to both entertain you, which for some reason become a dirty word in my profession, which is silly. I need to entertain you and I need to challenge you, not because I have something to teach you or because I'm smarter than you, but because when I'm in your seat, I want to be challenged. I want to be, I want a three course meal. I want to come in, I want to have an experience and I want to be in a public space to refer to your comment about the New York Times or the Week in Review. What the theater does better than anything is in a public arena, we come together, be it a small university college stage, be it the Beaumont, the greatest large theater in the Western world at Lincoln Center, and we publicly sit around the campfire and we have an experience. And what we can do, and what I certainly am trying to do as a playwright, which is different than journalism, is uh, journalism must maybe you'll disagree with me, but I think journalism must seek to find the truth. This is right, this is wrong, this is what really happened. And, you know, I bow to no one in my respect for that. And certainly in this moment, politically, we desperately need that. But what I can do, me and my brethren, sisters and brothers, is we simply ask more and more difficult, complex questions. The moment I'm trying to give you an answer, it's agitprop. But if I'm gonna share with you the questions that I don't have the answers to, there's something deeply political about us simply collectively listening and thinking about those kind of questions. Which is why, I mean, Oslo, and and there's no uh, spoilers because this is history, but Oslo leaves us, I mean, as the Oslo Accords do, they leaves us with the question of, well, was that all worth it? In other words, we do, you, yeah. the Oslo Accords happen and then they're still blowing each other up and they shoot this guy. And, and- it's so interesting because Writing this play, like any of the plays I've written over the last, let's say, 10 years, Blood and Gifts, set in the 80s with the AFPAC conflict with the Russians and the Soviets and the secret spies, or The Overwhelming, which is set on the cusp of the Rwandan genocide, in order to get into the world of the play, I've had to put, you always have to put very closed brackets around the timeline of the story and only focus on the moment the play is set against so that you're not being guilty of commenting or bringing information in that the moment of the play takes place right. the experience. And you do that because somehow, and I don't know how the alchemy of this actually works, but by only focusing on the past, it actually 
relates to the present. If you try to relate to the present, it doesn't work. Right. It so collapses. here I am. Right. Yeah. 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 Collapses is perfect. So here I am, in a weird way, almost autistically, and it, it, it be not to be flippant, but pretending as if what happened after Oslo doesn't matter or doesn't exist. I'm just trying to create this story, and then an audience comes and start to see it. And you have this shock of, oh, right, you have your own history with this and I have my own history that I was sort of putting away in a box but what's fascinating Doug is that when we did this play off Broadway in the Mitzi Newhouse last summer the audience would come and it was really a powerful experience and we sold out and it, you know I expected um, protests and we had preparation for actors having to leave the stage for their safety and instead we went to Broadway so it was quite shocking in the best way the, the positive response from the audience but even at its most a positive experience, you could feel the story, that the audience was taking the story, I'm gripped by this, I'm moved by this, and I'm cheering for these others, these foreigners, these non-Americans to achieve what they could do, which of course is the plot, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But we come back to Broadway six months later, Brexit has happened, the US presidential elections happened, up until last Sunday, the fear that France was gonna go the same way. And all of a sudden, without changing a word, the play became about the United States of America. And it was incredible. I'm getting a little mm. bit of hair yeah. in the back of my head just telling you this because it's just I'm in the middle of it still. You can feel the audience there. It's both more devastating and somehow far more hopeful than it was. I mean, the audience is weeping at the end of the play. And some of, well, a lot of that I can take no credit for. <laughs> That's simply the historical moment that my play happened to roll up against. But it's kind of amazing to see, I guess going back to your first question, people want to tackle serious issues in a public space. We are hungry to sit across from strangers and go, I too don't have answers. We're living in a moment, I think, technologically and politically where we are told and perhaps we assume that it's the opposite, that all we want to do is Facebook. But in fact, that's not what we want to do. Now, I say that as a Facebook user who should do less of it. But what we, what we hunger for is community. And theater provides that in a way that I suppose Netflix just doesn't. Well, look, everything has its... I was going to say everything has its purpose, but everything, art and entertainment, literature, movies, plays, there are stories and kinds of work that works best in different medium. I mean, I was sort of raised to believe that that as an artist you could do anything any way, but I don't, as a grown-up, I don't think that's true. I mean, you can, but it's sort of foolish to cut off your nose. There are kinds of stories that work best in long-form television. There are kinds of stories that work best as a poem, as a in this case, wildly, the three-hour long, I still can't believe it's three hours, three-hour long play. So it's not, I'm not gonna, in any way, you know, I watch my Netflix as you do, I'm sure, but for me, and probably, you know, despite my work in film and television, I am and will always be, you know, a playwright doing other things. Right, but there, because there's something unique about people gathering in a room together and watching other people talking and acting and doing. I mean, even Aristotle, I think when he was, was talking about the difference between, you know, an epic poem yeah. and theater, it was that, Oh, something weird is actually going no, you on can here. Feel there's a chemical change in the people. You can feel. You know, I, I love to sit in the back and watch the audience watch my play. One because I think it's my job is always to be learning. So I'm, I'm not. I don't want to be sort of taken into the play in a weird way. I mean, mm -hmm. It's my job to have that distance and see, even deep into a run. Oh, maybe I could change that line. Maybe I should cut that. Maybe I should make that tighter. And you're watching the audience watch it, and you can just physically see their bodies. Look, we're all on our smartphones. We're all addicted to media. We're all crazed in the urban world. So everyone comes in the way I do. You're just distracted and you're not waiting, you know, to the very last second. You're <laughs> only out of shame. Are you turning off your mobile phone and you're twitching and you're checking your program and you're picking your nose? And, you know, we're all New Yorkers, so we think we're experts, so we have our arms crossed. And you can slowly, and this is the thing that's so profoundly moving for me, is you slowly watch people uncross their arms lean in and quiet themselves. And so there are moments in the second act where there's long stretches of silence where a character's trying to decide how to respond to a surprise. And there's a th no, 1148 people sitting silently, waiting. And you think, in a strange way in the world we're living in now, that is a political act. 
the political act is we don't have the answers. It is, I am not, and we are not required to know everything. And humility is what we should be looking for, not expertise. I know. And then when you do compare the uh, actions and responses and attitudes of even the most arrogant characters in your play at their most agitated, it still feels compared to what we see on television now, it feels so contemplative and measured mm. and emotional. Which is so funny because it's so, you know, they are so wildly emotional and intense, but... I know, but you know what I mean? But it's what, like, yeah, that's a good question. I you wonder... want to see some civility? Look at yeah. the Arab the yeah, Arab right, Israeli right, conflict. Exactly. <laughs> you know what's really civil? An Arab Israeli conflict compared to, you know, ABC television. It's so civil. Yeah, I wonder. That's a really good question. I think... There is something so much in our entertainment. I'm 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 only hesitating because I don't want to be overly sweeping because the moment I say this, there's obviously profound exceptions. But I do think that we so often rush to the violent and the nihilistic. And I think maybe that's one of the reasons that with the theater, theater really can't get, with you know, the exception of um, Sarah Kane and certain other mm -hmm. writers that she grew up in in England. You know, there are there are rare exceptions of extraordinary dramatists who are. That, that delve into nihilism in a really dark way that I think is vital. But in general, I think the theater is, the very act of making live art is hopeful. Let's do you know, a play. Let's I got do, the curtains. Let's do a play. It's, yeah. You know, as an actress, I, I was in a summer stock and I was in college and, you know, we probably were drunk at the time. This young girl, this young hippie girl from Vermont just turned to me and smiled and said, you know, it's a play, not a serious, which is both unbelievably <laughs> cheesy and frigging true, you know? I think about that little exchange over bad past blue ribbon from 25 years ago all the time. There's something joyous about making theater that it pains me that, that it has fallen out of the center of the public conversation in our country. I mean, one of the joys of working in London all the time is the profession, simply the act of going to the theater and what is in a play is more at the center of the conversation. So I'm thrust instantly, even as an outsider, into the political discourse when I work at the National Theater. Well, it's but partly it, because of the way England is set up. Well, I mean, also, America is yes. so spread out and, and but it's also, is what I'm gonna unites wonk, us. I'll get wonky for a second, yeah. but also we are a visual culture and mm. the English are an oral culture. And the theater, you know, for me, I come out of the tradition of language-based theater. Theater's so, language, unless you're doing, you know, yeah. or, you know, Robert Wilson, but, whatever his name was, the big visual. Right, but people, yeah. so that's all true. But so going back to what I was trying to say was that just as a, as a person in the community, and separate from my own desires or ambitions as a playwright, it pains me when, that the theater isn't closer to the heart. And then when there are moments when a play does come, you know, and I'm having that experience on a level I haven't before with Oslo. And certainly this is the, the, the magnificent example of the last maybe even 15 years or 20 years is Hamilton, where it's thrilling and, and you want to you stand outside it and watch it as a theater practitioner and want to say, see, this is what you're all missing. Mm. <laughs> you don't know that you want this, but this is, this is, you know, I want to say good medicine that it has a you know, negative connotation, but this is, this is joyous and thrilling in a way that movies and poems and television and rock music, all of which I love, isn't. It's special. It's and special. It's in its, it's way. It's special in its way. And it's, but the, it's wonderful when it works. And the optimism of it is uh, the, the inherent optimism of theater is interesting. So even a, even a leer, even a, a, a crazy tragedy still has the human will striving towards a goal. The guy goes down, you know, Oedipus. I mean, they're, they're, they're still the, the optimism of humanity in it. I mean, and that's part of what I wanted to, to both, both, uh, I guess, push back on and, uh, and, and congratulate you for. I mean, the, the initial production of Oslo, which is really, it's about as I see it, it's about a guy whose will and hope for peace uh, just pushes these two different sides to the table. Someone who believes to the very end, no matter what happens, and sacrifices his relationships and his and his ego and his pride and his manhood, everything he has, he sacrifices to bringing these people together. Um, and th there, there's an optimism to that that is part of what inspired me to then uh, kind of leave behind these big critical economic 
books I've been writing and right. do Team Human, you know, yeah. both this podcast and just do a book to say, no, wait a minute, humanity can lift itself up by the bootstraps and and with solidarity and and perseverance and and a, a sense of joy and optimism and hope for the future, we can lift ourselves out of this despair and do something else. At the same time, <laughs> there, where's the butt? Bring the butt, yeah, but. It feels like we're going to hell in a handbasket. Yeah, and that, I, I mean, so great. So I can I can stand on the deck of the Titanic and cheer. Look at you all still struggling for survival as the boat goes down. There's still humanity here. Yeah, well, I ping between those two poles a lot. But... And and we could have this conversation in six months when my play has had its uh, peak and run and I could be back down onto a rut even darker than you. So that's, <laughs> there's that. Let me just put that out there. But I think trying to take the long... What, I'm tr what I try to do in my work as a writer and when I'm not getting crazy reading the New York Times and the Washington Post and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, as a citizen, I try, not only successfully, to pull myself back and say, okay, what is the broader thing going on here? And I do think that, I think that we are in the middle of an attempted counter-revolution in the way that, uh, you know, after the French Revolution was in the 1840s, I'm gonna be off by mm. a decade, so forgive me, there was that attempt. I think we are uh, in the middle of that, and I think that is the cycle of history. That, and I think that the, n the narcissism of all human beings is that whenever we are living in an historical moment, we put the greatest emphasis on the moment we are in because we can't conceive of another moment on some profound level being as important as the one we're in. So the question that I don't have an answer to, but I'm just sort of trying to keep in the front of my head is, is this as momentous as we think? And or is it simply this is what we are experiencing? And the thing that I ping back and forth is, are we at the end of the post-World War II democratic cycle? Are we at the end of something that we thought was endless? Or is it, or do we have to go back even farther and realize that that seventy years or so cycle is simply one part of a larger thing that we're not really seeing, you know, a ripple effect? I mean, look, we're. I'm pausing because, going back to something I said earlier, the moments of humility and trying to, you know, I I I find myself more in the last few minutes trying to prevent myself from going on a soapbox and trying to acknowledge that I simply do not know, you know, that that is the truth of it. None of us know, and we that's, don't know. that's okay, and, and, and I we're going to The waver. one thing that drives me crazy is on the left and the right, and I'm of the left, so I'm getting more driven crazy by the left because I'm more following our, our you know, sadly, our media versus their media, is the, the trope that's still being returned to of experthood and knowledge, and this is how it's going to play out, and this is what we should do, and that, it just infuriates me. It infuriates me. Um, I mean, listen... For the months leading up to the last presidential election, I was doing a lot because of this play and other projects I do. I'm very fortunate to to travel through lots of circles and deal with a lot of people in high political office. And I'm constantly at dinners and functions and just haranguing and pushing back at all these European you know, officials who are, who are true experts. I think me saying, you are wrong. The United States of America is not Europe. This man will never be president. Don't try to conflate our political system with yours. Well, boy, have I eaten a lot of political crow. <laughs> Boy, have I was I humiliated, and and rightfully so. You know, I was wrong, and I was not. Um, I was wrong, and so. I guess it's a long-winded way of saying to your pushback, you may be right. I think that what we have to do right now is to try to push forward while not getting lost in the weeds, because I just don't. It's just. I mean, my God. Just what's happened in the last three months in this country, every day, has just been inconceivable. Yeah. I mean, one thing you talked about was uh, this uh, presentism, which I've written a lot about. You know, this uh, inability to get out of the exact moment we're in and right. to, to do long-term thinking forward or long-term thinking back. I mean, which is both a symptom of living this way as well as the cause of living this way. You know, it, it feeds into um, this state of panic. And the more panicked we get, the more presentist we tend to get and then we turn to media that's extraordinary presentist the certainly the internet and the when 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 the daily newspaper is considered the long read right you know? right when that's the long read <laughs> now i just speaking of that just yesterday someone sent me 
uh, a profile from uh, from the New Yorker from almost 40 years ago, the Kenneth Tynan, you know, the great British critic of the 20th century, profile on Tom Stoppard, you know, still alive, still writing plays, extraordinary artist. And I just couldn't believe how long this thing was. This was a profile of the New Yorker. It was still, you know, with the long form we still have of great writing in the U.S. This thing was like 40 pages. And you think somehow that just the, the, the sheer page count of that boggled my mind. It's a small example of how things have changed. I mean, look, you know, you, you are so much deeper and knowledgeable about this than I am, but there comes periods where I simply just stop looking at Facebook or stop looking at social media because I don't want to continue to have people self-righteously talk about how evil the other side is, much of which I agree with, but it is pointless. It, the energy right. spent on telling each other how, how right we are is completely pointless. There's an attempt... I read this in passing on an airplane recently, and I didn't write down the name of the journalist, and I wish I had, but someone was talking about... It was a British press, I think, talking about our current pope. And the phrase that the journalist tossed off trying to encapsulate what was different and why things were so dramatically changing in the Catholic Church under his papacy was he used the word radical humility, the phrase radical mm. humility. And that really stuck with me. And I think it wended its way through my head as I was working on this play and sort of trying to go forward. I think that the moment, the political and media moment we're living in now, for me, any day, any moment, any project, any interview, when I am drifting away from an attempt to be radically open about everyone, that's when I get into danger. That's when the work is weak. That's when I'm working in a place of rage, which nothing good comes out of. But it's hard because you, I'm alarmist is an understatement for how I feel. And the trying to be engaged politically as a citizen, trying to be engaged politically as an artist, but at the same time trying to except in my bones that I could be profoundly wrong about things. You know, what if they're right? Right. I mean, that's the thing that I try, as an artist, I try to project and think about as an exercise for creativity and also maybe as a project I could write about this. What if me and mine and you and me and all of us liberal intellectual urbanites are wrong? What if we are absolutely wrong? Well, that's the, the interesting thing about theater then is... I mean, first, and the, the most important thing, and what I wanted to bring to Team Human is the idea that human beings sitting in a room in solidarity watching something together is the act. It almost doesn't matter what's on the stage. If you go in the room, you yeah. know, once you're there, you're that's making a good. profound statement. Where, where, well, where risk. You're dep that's the thing. Sorry, it's the mm -hmm. risk. The risk I wanted with this play, I was the question I was trying to explore, because you always got to have a question that's pushing you as the artist. Otherwise, it's just, you know, agiprop. What would it be like to go into a room to have the courage to sit across from the person you most hate, to see them as a human being, and then the unexpected thing is that you are changed by the act of you being able to see them differently. To me, that is the great challenge in the world today. Right. Well, you, if you do that, you're a collaborator. You right. Know, so well, that, yes, because this is the thing. Now, compromise is seen as moral cowardice when nothing ever right. is achieved in the world without compromise. And compromise means, by its definition, we all suffer. Right. I mean, that was my, my first or my second Team Human monologue for this, was saying, it was right after Bush became president, and I was like, well, I think what we should do is all go to his webpage and apply to be in his administration. Right. You know, and it was, people got so mad, and they thought I was joking, but I was like, no, you know, at least let's take him at his word to start, right. step up and join, you know, Obama never invited us. But the, the other thing about theater, though, this is kind of what I want to get to, the, the proof that one side or the other is right is whether the playwrights of that side can create realistic humans. In other words, right. if the humans, if you, we're watching people on stage, if they look like humans to us, then that person understands what humans are and deserves to be right. You know, and if they don't look like humans, then that's a problem here. Yeah, no, I, I was going to, you know, every time you try to write, create a project, a research a project, whether it happens or not, it always feeds something else, and that sounds you know, intellectually interesting, but it's amazing. It's so true, and I have to remind yourself because you think something is a failure because it doesn't happen, and then it leads to something else. So in the vein of this, I was working a few years ago. I, wanted, I was going to write a play for the National Theatre of London after they'd done my play, The Overwhelming, about rendition. Now, this is back before it was really it was well known as it now, which is basically the CIA setting up black ops sites around the world and helping to send people there to be tortured. 
And I got deep into this and I traveled around the world. I met people over the world who'd been tortured by the CIA. And finally, after almost two years of work, I realized that there was no play because a play has to have a dialectic where both sides can be right. Because I knew that not a single person in the audience would believe that torturing these people was right. Right, and, and more, even you bring George Bernard Shaw. I couldn't, yeah, right. I couldn't, couldn't do it. Yeah. a person who could defend it in a way. And so I say that too. The, the challenge for me and the joy of working in Oslo was to create a play where high-ranking members of the Palestine Liberation Organization, members of the Israeli government, I could find a way to invoke them in a way as people, as funny, charming, sexy, complicated, contradictory people, i.e. real people, that the audience, regardless of their own political right. relations, would go, I recognize exactly. that humanity. So you get the APEC, you, the APEC donating Upper West Side conservative Jew to go, rooting, ah, rooting, he's got a point. Rooting and, and <laughs> laughing at Boris Lee at the Lenin jokes. Right. The Marxist says, that's my favorite thing, is yeah. all of these folks laughing about Lenin jokes, not because of Lenin, but because they've learned to love this hardline Marxist character. You think, okay, well, that's... I'll put that in the success column for the play. Yeah. You know, it's very exciting. But there but in the end, what you what you are able to do as a playwright, I mean, I can do it as a director, I can't yet do it as a playwright, is uh you can depict human beings. And this is where my my biggest personal question, I don't know if it's of interest to my team human listeners, but it is to me. Um I was taught you know, Aristotle, Lalo's Egri, that that theater Char- a believable character, a real character, is a human being striving towards a goal. Yes. That people are in action, and if they're not in action, then they're not human. They're not theater. That and that we we move up this inclined plane of tension until we get to a moment of recognition and reversal, and then catharsis and denouement. Is that it? Is that really true? Is that the way humans? <laughs> in other is words, that is the that, secret sauce? Is that human reality, or are we just sitting around? I mean, <laughs> well, you know what I mean. Know, uh, I think it just depends on the writer. You know, I mean, I th- it, well, for you, when for you're me, making yes. humans, okay. you're for thinking, me, what does he want in this scene, and is he getting it or not, and what are his obstacles? I think often it's not as conscious or or linear or plotted out. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. But I think, you know, I come I come for, to being a playwright from being an actor. I never went to writing school. I never taken a writing class. Uh, I'm totally an autodidact. From 18 on, I went to uh-huh. conservatory acting training. So my, in essence, my academic education ended, well, really at 17. When I got into drama school, I stopped going to school. So at 17, my junior year of high school, from then on, it's just me, whatever. But it's you breaking on. down scenes and true yeah, yeah, but, and but, doing but, it. But the, what doing I mean this, is, so that. my, my, I feel very fortunate it, you know it took me i think far far longer to sort of launch a career as a writer because i didn't go to didn't have any contacts i didn't have any mentors i didn't have any you know no ivy league certificate right. that got me into the door but what i did have which i'm i cherish is that i i know how speech works in space and i know that the rhythm of the human voice and how to beat that out so that it actually physically propels an actor through a story and I know how to tell a joke, and I know, um, and this just comes with time, you know, get out of, and the, the best advice for any writer by David Mamet many, many years ago, get out of the scene, get into the scene late, and get out of the scene early. Um, and I think, so yes, I think for me as a writer, those things that you're ambivalent about, the Aristotelian constructions, et cetera, et cetera, I think a lot of it is true. It's very helpful. I think... I have a very dear friend who's a visual artist who years ago said to me, you know, I decided the last year or two to, you know, if I was going to keep breaking all these rules that I should really stop paying lip service and actually learn the rules and then know what I'm breaking. And after a year or two, we got together again and goes, you know, those rules are really good. (laughs) (laughs) I I kind of agree. I mean, I don't think of them as rules. I don't think of them as just, you know, there is on stage. You know, and someone like Annie Baker, my colleague Annie Baker, who whose work flies radically. Uh, our former babysitter. Your former babysitter. Annie's work flies radically in the face of this, and her work is really interesting. So, it, in no way is it. Um, I'm not. I'm just sort of saying. I guess that my interest as a storyteller just naturally gravitate toward this sort of action driven or the hunger that, it, that it, you know, never, as Lamford Wilson, when I was a very young man, said to me once, never give a character anything. Make them fight to the death for it. And I think that was good advice. And I think having people on stage 
So Mike Nichols said that all, he maybe he was quoting somebody else, but all good theater, the scenes are fights or seductions or arguments. And I really think that's quite good because that's broad enough to cover a lot. So, you know, there comes a point when you're working, you're like, you know what, this is the kind of theater I want to make. It seems inherently the kind of theater that I'm good at and that gets me up in the morning. And there comes a point where you're like, you just sort of stop. You know, my theoretical musings and stuff are all more and more about other people and other ideas. When it comes to work, I'm like, yeah, just this is what I'm going to do. I'm not even going to question it anymore. I'm just going to do it because it just seems to be what I need to do. And in some ways, the, the less I look at it, the better. Sort of like I need to spend my energy struggling to make it good as opposed to struggling over questioning whether this is the way to make it, if that makes sense. Do you feel, um, I remember uh, when Ibsen wrote Doll's House, uh, yeah. Shaw wrote these essays, the quintessence of Ibsenism. Yeah. And he was like, we need a new theater. You know, and he was saying we need a new theater because he was looking at we have to birth feminism and suffrage yeah. and get rid of uh, the lingering effects of slavery and colonialism. They were political progressives who thought we need a new kind of theater in order to break through and in order to have a new kind of society. Yeah. But do you think we're at a similar moment where where theater is kind of pushing at the boundaries of its of its own conventions in order to present something new or is this a moment more where we're returning to and retrieving the good old classic qualities of theater in order to rescue civilization from the brink just that in a ham sandwich by two o'clock right <laughs> wow that's a that's a lot i gotta unpack that douglas uh okay so i think i think one of the challenges with american playwriting especially american theater is in my adult lifetime, like if you, when I was a pop, as it were, 25 years ago, if you said to me, so in 25 years, who gets to have their plays done in New York City is going to be controlled by the Ivy League universities, I would have laughed in your face at the ludicrous notion of that. And lo and behold, the academization of the American theater, American playwriting profession has been profound. You've got Brown, you've got Yale, you've got Brooklyn College, you've got UCLA, you've got Harvard, um, and others. And it... I want to be very clear about this. It's not that there aren't remarkable playwrights, many of whom are colleagues who are coming out of this, and Columbia University is another one. But my concern as a theater goer, again, broadly speaking, is that in the same way what has happened to fiction and poetry in this country over a longer period, ours is what I'm talking about is more condensed, in a more condensed time that we're living in, the theater has been shifting towards an internally focused, philosophically rich, but to put it pejoratively, navel gazing kind of work. A little solipsistic about uh, you thing. know theater being made for other theater people. Right. Some of it amazing. Well, they're the only ones who are going to theater. It seems like sometimes. But that's then that's just a self perpetuating right. suicide. Right. And my feeling is, uh, where's the joke? Where's the gun going off in the second act? Where's the play that can fill a thousand seats and bring someone from the suburb who hasn't been to a play in 20 years to remind them how fucking glorious this is? And so I feel that we've let, again, I'm being very broad here and there are wonderful exceptions. And um, I, I feel that we have slowly become, that the, the scope, the bandwidth has become narrow and narrow and more refined and elegant and everything is lace when we need an oak tree also. And so I guess using that to answer your question, I think that it isn't that we need to go back to the good old days by any stretch. I mean, you know, the funny thing about Oslo, which is held up, which is very kind for anything in mind to be held up, held up is both positively and negatively, depending on who you're speaking to, is this old-fashioned, big, you know, classic play. But in fact, I completely break the Aristotelian rules. That's three hours of the same experience happening over and over and over again. It is the antithesis of Aristotle. And it's like 80 but little scenes. It's like 80 little scenes, <laughs> and it's literally a series of men walking in and out, led by one extraordinary woman, men walking in and out of a room. So Who are it, all in love with her, by the way. Uh, well, of course. I mean, well, also, I mean... If, Jennifer Ely was playing you. Yeah. I mean, she's, the greatest, not in love with she's her anyway. perhaps yeah. the greatest stage actress of our generation. Yeah. And so the funny thing is when people say to me, I'm sort of bemused, I'm like, I don't think you really understand how not. On one hand, it is traditional. My work is traditional in that it is often linear and it is um, a fourth wall is often held up, etc. But in fact, I'm constantly purposely breaking the rules 
because the story requires it. I guess that's I guess that's it. The form of the play should be dictated by the needs of the story. I think that and that that's how you decide as opposed to oh, this is how I write. This is the kind of theater we should have. And I think you know the office of theory is a bad one to visit for the playwright. Right. An but example need, is, yeah. you know, Mr. Mamet, who right. he's been beaten up on. So I don't. I, I revere his early work. He transformed my life. If I met him tomorrow, I would fall at his feet. But it pains me to see his work become so stilted over the last 20 years. And I think it's because he's tried, and good Lord, I could be wrong. And again, I've written nothing as good as Glengarry Glen Ross. It's a work of genius. But it pains me because I feel that the off, it, he has spent so much time theorizing about his work that consciously or unconsciously his work has shifted to try right. to, to prove a point as opposed to ask a question. So I don't, I don't Which again that. is proving a point to theater people who've read the theory. And, <laughs> right, and yeah. it's just, it's not, um, you know, and, and I think here's the other thing, sorry, I was thinking about this yeah. just popping into my head. I think for me, both a theater goer and a theater maker and just in the culture in general, what I'm after all the time is to invoke a sense of wonder. That that is what we're missing. I feel I'm impoverished about that in my own life. That the awe of wonder, the joyous, terrifying, confounding qualities that come with true wonder, where your hairs go back in the back of your neck and you feel, I am small yet large at the same time. Mm. I wish to laugh and cry at the same time. I am alive. That's what I'm trying to do because when you know when I have this experience as an audience member. Look, most I mean most theater is terrible. Yeah. There's nothing worse than going to the theater and it's bad. You're trapped. You Especially hate everything. Especially if your friends are in it. Your yeah. friends are in. You can't leave. And one of the one of the and I say this in quotation mark problems of being successful is I'm never allowed to leave the theater anymore because everyone knows. But then you see a play that's good and it's like a spiritual awakening and you just you just then you have this terrible moment like. Oh my God! What have I missed that's this good that I didn't go to, and how you know wh- how my life could have been improved and transformed by that? Well, and that's the beauty. I mean, the beauty of Asa. One of them is, I mean, there's a moment at the end of the play when all the characters from the play are standing up, all facing toward the back of the theater, and you are in wonder. The whole audience is just a you know, jaw dropped, <gasps> and they're in there. But the beauty for me, the beauty of that of that kind of awe and wonder is most of us these days only know how to experience awe and wonder in non-human contexts. You go to Yosemite and look at the waterfall. Right. There's no people around. I'm in wonder. I look at this building. I'm in wonder. You know, and now to to have people look at other humans. Oh, that's so beautiful. And though. be in yeah. wonder. It's like that's uh, it's so socializing and community making and civilization building as opposed to this uh, destructive anti-human tip we seem to be on. Yeah, where we're, we're all somehow we fall into this rut and I have to fight against it. And I'm as guilty of it at times as anyone where you there's that, you know, it's like intelligence and experthood is somehow linked to both narcissism and cynicism. Like, mm-hmm. You know, it's somehow that to be knowing is to need to be cynical, which is really unhealthy and 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 self-destructive but i think it's a defense mechanism i think you know the fact is that we are all frightened we are all worried that everybody else has the answers and we have to pretend that we do and whenever i go to speak to young writers all i talk about is fear and failure and i say no matter how terrified you are you i know exactly what you're all thinking right now about your own work and they're sort of blown away it's like because i feel the exact same way every damn day when i wake up and i promise you stephen sondheim feels the same way and arthur miller until the day he died felt he wasn't as good a writer as he should have been he didn't have the answers and he was a fraud on a wednesday you know and we all have this experience but we we think we're the only ones so we create this shield around ourselves and one of the things the theater can do is in it no matter how scary or dynamic the play is, it is a safe space. Safe in the sense that you're physically not going to be attacked most of the time. Probably. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> um, but also that there is a codified structure that we're sitting together and we have collectively agreed to have this experience. Now, occasionally someone's phone will go off that's infuriating or, you know, on rare occasions someone will stand up and yell at an audience, yell from the audience, you know. Um, but there is, you know, rules are not all bad. That's something that we on the left need to be more clear about. Um, and and creating that structure where we have that safe space allows an unburdening of the armor. Right, and then you get to be the soft and squishy person that you really are. Yeah. On a good day. Yeah. Well, well thanks. I mean, that's, that's the thing. I And I hadn't gotten to experience it in a long time, uh, watching the audience come out of Oslo. And the, the faces are different. The whole the bodies are relaxed, and people are like, 
Oh. I mean, it was so it's so inspiring and so sad at the same time. But I guess that's the trick. You know, you don't know how you feel, and you just then stay with that. Mm, mm. <laughs> Is uh, as long as you can, right? That's the thing. It's so hard to it's so hard to 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 sustain a feeling of ambivalence and unknowing. You know, but in a weird way, when we're in those states, is when we're most alive, and then we somehow we slip back into to knowing. Right. Well, because there's something that seems to be at stake. Right. You know, and then or off phone, it goes. Our phone is ringing once again. And, you know. Wow. Yeah. Well, I just want to thank you for uh, for writing your plays, for keeping theater alive. Thank you, Doug. This and was this was really a great conversation. I really. It's so nice to just sort of free range like this. So it's different you. than your no, <laughs> typical just, NPR show, I it's think. It's so nice to have questions you don't have the answer to and you sort of figure it out as you speak with someone, which is always a rare treat. Well, thank you. Thank you for being on Team Human. My great pleasure, Douglas. Thank you for participating on Team Human. 